Uh, welcome to the CSMVS. We are really happy to see such a large turnout. Today is a very special lecture. Uh, may we begin by inviting Mr. Mukherjee to deliver the welcome address. Good evening, friends. Thank you for coming. Since morning, we had a lot of anxiety whether we would be able to organize the lecture or not. You all know the reason. And uh, I think after, after 1, 1 1.30, we took the decision, let's move ahead with the program. And I'm so happy you all turned up. Thank you so much. On behalf of trustees and staff of the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Bastu Shangrahalai, on behalf of uh, the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute, Harvard University, I extend a warm welcome and greetings to everyone. Thank you, Narayan, Dr. Narayan, and Professor Gina Kim. Though we were talking to each other, over, over the telephone, but uh, didn't get the opportunity to meet. Uh, and we are meeting for the first time. Uh, I was in touch with uh, Dr. Mina, the director, South, South Asia Institute, and uh, your director, uh, Mr. Khanna. Thank you, thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanjay Kumar, mm -hmm. India Country Director, the Mittal Institute, Harvard in Institute, Harvard University. Uh, unfortunately, Meena could not manage to come. She was in touch with us all the time. I just want to share in a few moments, uh, and, and then I disappear. I don't want to stand in between. Uh, it was sometime in 2014 I was invited by Harvard South Asia Institute to deliver a public lecture on museum rethinking CSMBS a case study. It was actually that interaction brought both the two iconic institutes together for the first time. It was Professor Torun Khanna, director, and Miss Meena Hewitt, executive director, South Asia Institute, who had initiated the dialogue on international museum management and conservation program. We have been working for quite some time on developing a world-class museum management training program in collaboration with the British, British Museum. And then that, you know, we experimented later uh, in, in 15 with the help of uh, Neil McGregor and the first uh, leadership, museum leadership uh, training program uh, initiated at the CSMBS in collaboration with the British Museum and later on government of India, government of India participated in the program. And that program uh, for two years we continued uh, with the support of the government and later government could not support the program due to some reasons, unknown reasons. But there was a very strong desire to do something uh, for, 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 for museum professionals in India, for cultural institutes in India. Wherever I went, any part of the country, the problem we encountered, leadership. And there is a leadership crisis in the country, particularly in the cultural domain. Uh, for your information, and many of you know, probably aware of the situation, most of our iconic institutes are headless. Because we could not create an institute 
after 70 years of India's independence uh, on the line of IIM, IIT. So you produce 30 leaders for the country and they take care of all cultural institutes. That was you know, our plan, our design, and we submitted our plan to the Ministry of Culture that we have to have an institute dedicated to heritage management. But when it comes to quality, we are not going to compromise. And, and then they asked me, uh, you have any model? I said, I am Ahmedabad. It's a brand, you create a brand. And when you produce 30 leaders for the country, you ful fulfill your needs. And next time, you know, you produce another 30, you export. So today what is happening, IIT, IIM, when they pass out, many of them leave the country because there is a demand outside. So that was the whole idea. Unfortunately, that didn't work. So we approached Harvard University. Can we do something together? And Mina was instrumental. She said, you know, why not we do something together, at least in the field of conservation? And then we talk about the management. Maybe, you know, museum management and conservation together. So today, you know, we have uh, Narayan, and uh, Gina Kim, uh, representing South Asia Institute, Harvard University. And tomorrow we will have the roundtable conference. We invited experts from all over the country, and they are all present here. And, and, and particularly, you know, our friend Bino Daniel, in spite of his very busy schedule, he came all the way from Chennai. Thank you, Bino, I appreciate. Mr. Giri Kumar, and all you know, my friends and colleagues, they are all here, present here. And tomorrow we will have the day-long roundtable, closed door meeting. Idea is to come up with something. So that is the you know uh, background, uh, the the collaboration between CSMBS and Herbert. I'm grateful to the participants of the meeting for accepting our invitation and my sincere thanks to the trustees of both the institutes for supporting the idea. And whenever, you know, this is, this is one of the unique institutes in the country, and we are fortunate to be in Mumbai, and that is why every time I say I love Mumbai, I love people of Mumbai. Whenever we need any support, we just share with our friends. So we want a little support we shared it with our friend, Mr. Hiramath. And he was immediately, you know, he didn't take much time. Whatever support you need, we are there. And like, you know, as always, sending the check to support the project, to support the program. So we are grateful to Joy and Suganda Hiramath and Heikel Limited for the support, supporting this event. Thank you so much. We all appreciate your support. <laughs> thank you, Naran. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. I would now like to invite Dr. Devangana Desai, our trustee, to felicitate our speakers today. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. Mr. Narayan Khandekar leads the Strauss Center, that is the Harvard Art Museum's conservation and research activities, as well as those of the Center for the Technical Study of Modern Art. Specializing in the scientific, anal anal 
specializing in the scientific analysis of paintings and painted surfaces, he has published extensively on the subject. He curates the Forbes Pigment Collection and the Gettins Collection of Binding Media and Varnishes. Over to Mr. Khandekar. I, I first of all want to thank um, Mr. Mukherjee for the invitation to attend. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to, to speak to you and also to the um, Mittal South Asia Institute in our South Asia Institute at Harvard, up, um, at Harvard for the opportunity to come here. And this is my first visit to Mumbai since 1966, so I am very excited to have some experiences I remember, I will remember. So um, without any further ado, I will go forward. So I, I do want to put this up just in case there are any indigenous Australians in the audience that um, one of the artists that I'll be talking about has died and I'll be referring to him not with his full name and I, I just want to put this up here as a warning. So I'm going to talk about the Forbes pigment collection but I also want to give you some background into the, um, the work that we do and some of the history of the Harvard Art Museums as well. So when you come up to the fourth floor of the museum this is what you see, the, the pigment collection is laid out in cabinets across the courtyard. The building was renovated in 2014, and this is what it looks like now. Those of you who visited before will remember a, a very different building, but it still has the same collection and the same courtyard. We use the collection as a basis for identifying the materials and techniques that a work of art is made of. So we look at, we use these as our standards and we look at what the artist used, the, the choices that the artist makes, the um, changes that happen with pigments over time, anything that's original or restoration. So we use it to, to answer a number of different questions and these are things that I'll be going into shortly. Now it didn't always look so flash and this is the first Fogg Art Museum which was in this old building from the um, 19th century and it had not really many original works of art, but more plaster casts and copies of, of works from Europe. And the second director of the museum, Edward Forbes, who you see here, was um, very committed to bringing original works of art so that the students could experience a, original art face to face to experience the real power of art. And he added collections, added to the collection very extensively and what he was a very careful buyer, but sometimes he was taken in by untrustworthy dealers. And um, this is one of those examples where you can see this is what the painting looked like when he bought it. And then after the retouching and the varnish was taken off, you can see that there's no flesh areas left on the, the virgin and child. And so he, he didn't want to have this happen too often. And what he, he decided is that he needed to understand what materials were used by the artists so that he could differentiate restoration from original and also understand how the artists made works of art and in doing so he put together what is a really important collection of reference material and it was part of his major scheme for the Fogg Art Museum he built a new building in 1927 so that's you know 90 90 years ago he started something called the Museum Course, and it was run with he and Paul Sachs, and what they did was introduce professional standards for museum workers. And it introduced this idea of accountability, transparency, of record keeping that, was so, that is so important for the, the museum. And Sachs also ran a course that was revolutionary called Museum Work and Museum Problems, and it was revolutionary because he was admitting that museums have problems and that's something that we all know is true but back then people didn't want to want to talk about and part of this um, renovation of the idea of museum professionals was the introduced the creation of a conservation department and he employed the first scientist in a US museum Rutherford John Gettins <coughs> and he also employed George Stout who worked at Harvard, he did a lot of interesting things which I'll explain in a minute.
but he also went on to be a monuments man. So in the Second World War, he went to Europe and helped save a lot of the artistic heritage that was in Europe from being accidentally destroyed as the <coughs> Allied forces, forces moved through Europe. And another part of the, this idea of introducing accountability was to produce a journal. So from 1932 to 1942, the Fogg Art Museum produced a journal, Technical Studies, and one of the things that George Stout did was actually develop this idea of a condition report. It's something that we take so for granted, but until this was published, it really wasn't something that people did. And you can see an example of it here. Um, this is from 1938 that I just pulled out of the files. So it really, you know, the, the fog was a big part of the, the changes that were going on at the time. But I, I also wanted to point out that India was not far behind. If you look at the history of scientific labs that um, were introduced in the development of conservation and conservation science, you find that you've got the Ratgen in the 19th century, British Museum, and then Harvard Art Museum. So it was really the first scientific lab to look at paintings and works of art. And then in Madras, which is now Chennai, um, in 1930 a lab was set up and that was um, directed by Mr. Paramasivan. And there's a paper that has just been written by a colleague who works in Baltimore, Sanchita Balachandran, that will, it's published online, it hasn't come out in press yet, so um, it outlines the amazing work that was going on in the early 20th century in, in um, Madras. But if you look at what the Fog Lab looked like, and then you look at what the lab in Madras looked like, they're actually very similar. You can see that India was right there at the, the front. And there was also, um, in technical studies, articles on Indian art. So Mr. Um, Kurama Swami was um, publishing. He was the curator of Indian art at the Museum of Fine Arts. And actually, I noticed that there was a, a Kumara Swami um, building. And is it the same guy, same person? OK, which is I, I didn't know about, so it's exciting to make these connections. Um, and this is Mr. Paramish Devan talking about um, paintings inside temples. So it's, you can see that in the early 20th century that India was really sort of participating in the, the worldwide conversation of conservation and also of, of um, technically understanding how a work of art was made. And here are some um, photographs of the lab. So this is cleaning, these are the electrolytic baths for getting corrosion off the sculptures. And Gettin said, um, it gives me great, so he's writing to Paramisivan, it gives me great pleasure to get in touch with other chemists working in my own field since there are so few of us and we're so widely scattered. And the response was, as you say, chemists working in this field are so few and far apart that it is difficult to get immediate information and help, especially in India, which is far separated from centers of scientific activity in this field, both in Europe and America. So even though Paramis Sivan was feeling very isolated, Gettens, who was supposedly at the center, was also feeling the same isolation. And it may have led to articles like this where he wrote an article about how to send samples through the mail. And so that was a way of alleviating that, that sense of isolation that you can share work, you can share immediacy, um, the immediacy of what is going on in your lab with your colleagues. But back to pigments. And Gettens and Stout used Forbes's collection to write what is still the, the go-to volume on the history of pigments, the chemistry of pigments and their uses. It's um, painting materials. And this is the first edition. This is my copy from 1989 and you can see it's pretty tattered and it, it tells you how much it gets used. And it's the pigments that I'm talking about that were used in this, this amazing volume. So the, the collection started just before Forbes became the director in about 1908. So Forbes became director in 1909. And these are just some early examples of the, the pigments. So Forbes would travel around and buy things mostly from Europe and from America. Um, when he 
went to London, he bought a lot of materials in 1914 from Robeson, the, the colourman there, including this ball of Indian yellow. And we all know that um, the story about that, that Mr. a different Mr. Mukherjee in the, the 19th century um, visited where the pigment was manufactured, saw cows eating mango leaves, the urine being collected, dried into balls, and then being used as pigment. And this was reported, people have tried to discount that. Um, Victoria Finlay visited where Mr. Mukherjee went and actually said that there was no evidence as a reporter that he did this, but some colleagues at SUNY Buffalo, um, so it's the State University New York Buffalo, have done research on this ball and several other balls of Indian yellow and found evidence that it comes from a ruminant, that there's um, evidence of plant material and evidence of urine. So it seems like the story might actually be more true than people have thought. And so that's, that's actually exciting. And they also found the original materials that Mr. Mukherjee sent to Kew in England, in London. So they've actually got the original materials and they were analyzing those as well. Um, there's also other unusual material, there's mummy. So that's, it's a pigment made from ground up Egyptian mummies. Um, it's an unusual choice of material, but mummies were not very, they, they were used for all sorts of things. The Egyptian railroads would use them to power locomotives. There was a shortage of um, linen to make good paper in the mid 19th century, so a lot of Egyptian mummies got unwrapped and were used as, um, to make linen, and you know, apparently also used to make pigment. So. We ha and this is what it looks like, it's very nondescript brown, but I think it's the source that's more impressive. Um, we have dragon's blood, which is from a rattan palm. It is a very bright red pigment, um, and unfortunately it fades, so this is a hun over 100 years old, it's actually gone quite brown. We have um, ultramarine that comes from Afghanistan, it was shipped from a single mine in northern Afghanistan down by donkeys and then shipped over to Europe and the name ultramarine means that it comes from beyond the seas. And we have different grades of ultramarine here showing how much you can concentrate. The, so the very deep blue is the most concentrated blues and then as it becomes less blue you have more and more of the transparent sort of crystalline material diluting it but you can see it used to great effect in this Botticelli painting, um, painting the Virgin's mantle. We also have things that show how artists use their materials. So this is a palette by John Singer Sargent that we've just done a, a project on and written about it. it um, if anyone has any doubt, Edward Forbes, that's EWF, said this belonged to John Singer Sargent. He wrote that when he, he got the, um, the box of paint from Sargent's studio. And we have his paint brushes and palette knives and so on. So these are all evidence on how artists painted, which are a great reference material. Um, other collections that we have, this, this is a, another collection of material that was used to paint this picture that's in MoMA in New York. So we have the source material for a very specific painting so we can make those, those kinds of connections. And in 1931, Forbes visited his brother in Japan. His brother was the US ambassador to Japan and bought a lot of pigments. We've got an entire cabinet of Japanese material and we're working with the curator um, to understand what it all means. I, I can't read kanji and so we're trying to work out what exactly each bottle contains and what it means. And then people, as Forbes's collection grew, people would travel and buy things themselves and bring them back. So we have pigments here used um, that uh, were used by Islamic artists to make miniatures. These were purchased and brought back. So we have different, several sets of these kinds of miniature painting materials that were collected in the 1930s. Um, this is from the wife of Eric Schroeder, who was a, a scholar of Islamic art. We have collections of pigments. So this is from Don Luis um, Plandura. And he was an important collector of medieval art in Barcelona, but also in charge of the artistic installation in this palace, which is now the Museum of Catalan Art. Nobody remembers this building as much as they remember just down the hill, the Mies van der Rohe building, 
uh, um, for the Barcelona Pavilion. So, but it's well worth a visit if you have a chance. You can see these kinds of things. We want to find out if there's any connection between our pigments and what's going on inside the palace. And the Forbes collection is good in that it has a lot of variety of pigments, but it also has great depth as well. And each pigment manufacturer has its own way of making pigments, so you need the same color pigment made by lots of different manufacturers, as well as lots and lots of different colors by different manufacturers. So let me start again. You need you need a variety of the same color by different manufacturers, and you also need the palette from the same manufacturer. And this is what we have in the collection, and it's actually very exciting to be able to use this as a, a source of reference material. And the pigments can come from all sorts of different places. So we have um, insect-based materials that come from Kermes, which is a, a scale insect that grows on a, um, an oak tree. You take these balls, you crush them up, and then a red dye comes out. You can then turn that red dye into a pigment. Cochineal, which grows on a cactus. It um, was brought from America to Europe by the Spanish and became the source, second largest source of um, wealth for the Spanish, um, Spanish Empire. Tyrian purple, which is from the, the mollusk of the, the, the murex mollusk, and you take a gland, you squeeze that gland, and you get this dye that comes out, this purple dye that develops on exposure to sun. I found it once in a painting, and it's, on, it's this, this painting on these two banners inside. It's a very rare, rarely used pigment on paintings. You find it a lot more on, on manuscripts. From plants, you can get different pigments. So you extract the red dye from Brazil wood, from madder, from dragon's blood, There's a yellow pigment from weld, and then you get the dye out. You can put it onto a transparent mordant, which then precipitates, and you can use it as a pigment. Again, we've got varieties of the same pigment from different sources, so two different umbers that you can see the difference in color. Semi-precious stones, so this is malachite that gets ground up and used as a, as a pigment. Malachite and azurite appear together, and you can use both of them as pigments, so you get the green and the blue, and they're, they're used together. Um, different minerals, orpiment, which is a yellow arsenic-containing pigment, arsenic sulfide, and realgar, which is a red version, which is chemically quite similar. So on exposure to light, realgar turns into orpiment, and then orpiment on exposure to light loses its color. So you can see that this sample of orpiment's actually been exposed to a lot of light. There are pigments that are made by synthesis. Lead white is made by exposing lead metal to vinegar, which turns it into a lead acetate, and then that's buried in dung, and that produces carbon dioxide, and then you get lead carbonate forming. So from cow dung, you get this incredibly white, very important pigment being formed. Lead tin yellow, which was used in the Renaissance up until 1750 when it was replaced by Naples yellow, it disappeared for several hundred years. It was rediscovered in Munich in 1941. And this is a sample from very close to its rediscovery. So, you know, pigments are, come from all different kinds of, of places. We also add new pigments to the collection as they come onto the market. So from, um, let's see, BASF, from Sun Chemicals, from um, Crema Pigmente, and we just add these things as they, they become available. And analyzing pigments used to be done this way. This is one of the microscopes in the collection, and you do these like microchemical tests and look at the reactions, but now we use a variety of different equipment, and it helps us identify the pigments in a very, very precise way. And I just want to explain very quickly, I'll run through several examples of how this is done. So these are three paintings that were thought to be by Jackson Pollock. Um, the provenance was very good, the person who owned them. His parents were very good friends with Jackson Pollock. We analyzed them because he was going to give us one and we wanted to find out more about it. And we actually found out that there was a red pigment 
pigment red 254 that wasn't invented until 1974 and it wasn't commercially available until 1986. And that's great, except that Jackson Pollock died in 1956. So he died 30 years before it was commercially available. So that, that was a big problem. And this yellow pigment from 1969, so again, that's some 15 years before Jack, uh, after Jackson Pollock died. <coughs> and then another colleague looked at this painting. On the back, it's got JP. It's painted over this silver paint, and Jamie Martin found that that silver paint wasn't available until 1989. So we could actually say that these paintings were probably done in the, in the 1980s, at the very earliest, probably the 1990s. And the, they were made with material that wasn't available at Jackson, during Jackson Pollock's lifetime. We don't know who painted them or why they, they were painted. And you need to balance where the information that you get. You need provenance, which shows where the painting comes from. You need people to look at the object and say, yes, this looks like the work by the artist. And you also need the materials to be consistent and at least to be available during the artist's lifetime. Another example is looking at um, this French 19th century painter, Eugène Delacroix, and he kept very extensive diaries of his um, use of pigments for this painting. We have this in the Fogg Art Museum. This is in San Paolo, and we didn't know what this represented. We didn't know what, which painting he was talking about. So we went through, we translated it, and you can read about all the different pigments, vermilion, yellow zinc, cadmium, and so on. So we, we went through and translated it, worked out what he was talking about. Then we took samples that related to the journal entry. And what we found is that in the fog painting, there was this nice connection between the lake and the vermilion. So you can see vermilion, lake, vermilion. There's more lake, vermilion, lake and so on. So you see this layering that, that's going on. We didn't find that in the Brazil, the painting from Brazil. And we also found, he talks here on um, like young flesh. He talks about vermilion lake. And we actually found these lake pigments here, which is not vermilion at all. It's a, it's a lake pigment that is vermilion colored. <coughs> and we didn't find that on the other painting as well. So what we were able to, so I then went to Br Brazil um, and took similar samples. We were able to compare the two paintings and we found that there are some similarities between the journal and the actual painting in the Fogg collection. So he talks about um, light chrome and he says that it's dangerous. So we found it in the Fogg painting, which is the sketch, but not in the finished painting. So it seems like he was writing down notes to warn himself about what pigments to use and what not to use, and he heeded his own advice. So it gives us insight into the, the actual practice of Delacroix as he was um, developing the, this large commission. We found this joli gris, this mixture of cobalt white and um, umber, and we found this layer of um, vermilions and lakes. We also found this castle, which is a, a clay, or actually, sorry, it's a, um, it's like an asphalt type material. And we found it here as well. So we found all these things that pointed the journal entries to the fog sketch. And then we found that these adjustments in the, from the, the journal into the finished painting. So we're able to actually understand a lot about the, the actual artistic practice. Um, understanding the pigments can also help us care for the collection. So Harvard has a group of paintings by Mark Rothko, an important um, mid-20th century artist who um, painted these, these large form pictures with, with um, colored forms on a, a floating on a, on a um, background. They were installed in this building which has full um, windows from the ceiling to the floor. And you can see that there was a lot of sunlight that came in. This, was, um, this caused the paintings to fade rather badly. And we wanted to understand why they had faded. So we took a, a cross section from one of them. So this is what it looked like originally. This is what it looks like now. 
and you can see that it's faded quite a lot. And we wanted to understand what was going on with the painting. So we, you could see there are just two layers of paint. We could identify lithol red up here. We could identify lithol red, but we didn't know what was going on. You know, it, it seemed to be the same pigment. So we worked with the chemistry school and we synthesized lots of different versions of lithol red. So there's a calcium, sodium, barium, and strontium salts. And we collected spectra. We then compared the spectra and you can see that there's a shift in this peak. And we were able to actually go back and identify that the calcium salt was in this area that had faded the background, whereas on the, the figure, it was a sodium salt and that hadn't faded. So we were able to apply our research into the pigments, into understanding the, the painting. And if you turn this into the sort of macro scale, you can see here that the background is where it's faded and the figure has um, retained its color. So we then used that when we were looking at another Rothko painting to go up on the um, gallery walls and we're identifying lithol red in this background and it has the calcium salt so we know it's very light sensitive. We then wanted to um, determine how much light could be used to display it and how long to keep it up so that we didn't cause any, any damage. So um, Georgina Rain and one of my colleagues is doing some microfading tests on the surface of the painting and we're, we've determined now that it can go on display at low light levels for a certain number of months. And the last project I want to talk about is just collecting pigments for a study of Australian Aboriginal bark paintings. It's something that was um, very dear to my heart. I grew up in Australia, so I used to see bark paintings all the time in museums and really was fascinated by the fact that there were no scientific studies into the binding media or the pigments. And so we went ahead and did a detailed study in collaboration with a number of different museums, but we also visited art centers. So this is on the Tiwi Islands just off the coast of Bath, uh, sorry, um, this is Bathurst Island off the coast of Darwin. And Gordon Papungamiri digging white ochre out of it. We um, went, drove around the point to where the yellow ochre deposit was. We had to wait, there was a crocodile that had walked here and left tracks, you can see the belly scales pushed into the sand. It was like, these were 10 minute fresh tracks. So it, I, it was quite an exciting sort of visit. Um, we visited um, Kununurra. I talked with Mr. Griffiths, who's the artist that just recently died, and his wife Peggy. They talked to us about making black pigments. They took us to a dreaming site where white, they collected white pigments to use in their paintings. We visited other locations in Yakala. We talked to artists. So this is Nyapa Nyapa preparing a, a painting. This is Molkan Wapanda. And these are, these are two very, very important artists. Their they're paintings are in every collection in the country. And Molkan is showing us the use of orchid juice, rubbing it onto the bark. And um, Nyapa Nyapa is showing us how she grinds pigments and then mixes it with PVA and then paints with it. So we had a, a great time collecting pigments. We were hoping that we would be able to analyze the pigments, collect a, a chemical fingerprint, and then relate that to the paintings that we'd analyzed. And it didn't quite work out, but what we were able to do was to add our data to the work that Rachel Popelka Philkoff is doing in Adelaide and add to her, her um, pigment atlas. And I just want to mention that we keep collecting and adding to the, the pigment collection. So we've got Vanta Black. It's famous because Anish Kapoor, the British artist, Indian British artist, um, has the exclusive license to it and only he is allowed to use it. He issues um, variances on occasion. Uh, <laughs> there's, um, we have people who are experts in historic pigments. They manufacture them and send them to us. Mas Subramanian, another Indian who um, developed um, Yin Min Blue, and he's been um, getting that into the, into the world of artists, but also um, in industrial applications as well. Um, Porfirio Guterres, who is a, a Zapotec weaver and dyer, gave us samples. So you know, we keep adding to, to the collection. 
and things that have happened as well that we just never could have predicted. So Jonathan Olivar is, is a designer. He's done work for Nike. He's done work for Knoll, for Vitra. He's, you know, he's, he's not yet 40 and he's a superstar. He, um, he came and visited us to make, um, help him decide on the colors of fabric to use on a, a day bed. And so he used the pigment collection. We went through it and he chose these pigments that came out of the earth and there are some 20, actually 19 pigments that he used to make this fabric. It got launched in Milan in April. And so, you know, we never thought that our pigments would be used as a, a start for something that, that um, would be used in the design world. And it's also, um, we've had two books that have been published about the pigment collection. The books have sold out. Again, you know, usually we publish a book and then we have to pay a lot of money to keep it in storage. You know, 2,000 copies sit there in storage, you know, eating, eating away at our, our resources. But these sold out, which is amazing. It shows how much people are interested in pigments. And there's also a display case that we have where the public can get up close to the pigments. And so each year I change it. So this was the first version. This is the second version. And I think that's, that's all I want to do. I just want to say thank you to these people and also to San Sanchita and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Khandekar. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, Professor Jinnah Kim is the director of the arts program at the Mittal Institute. Professor Kim's research and teaching interests cover a broad range of topics with special interests in intertextuality of text image relationship, art and politics, female representation and patronage, issues regarding reappropriation of sacred objects, and post-colonial discourse in the field of South and Southeast Asian art. Over to Dr. Kim. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Vaide, for that introduction. Um, so, and I would like to start by a customarily, uh, really out of my heart, uh, thanking the Mittal Institute and the Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, hello. Uh, CSMBS for inviting uh, me and uh, Dr. Kandekar to come give a talk and the generous supporters of both institutions for providing this opportunity to, to share this talk today. And thank you all for coming. So, so I started the talk by taking a, a very, uh, making a very simple question how blue is Krishna does you know Krishna mean Krishna in Sanskrit mean blue these are very simple questions it might sound quite idiotic actually to ask but answers to this these questions are not simple as you may think um, so art history exam 101 I've called up some images from uh, paintings of Indian paintings roughly dating between 1425 to 1800. I hope you can tell which one is earliest, which one is the latest. Kind of have a sense, right? It will make a great uh, puzzle book, I guess, uh, to do a, a, a good, good grilling project for my students to actually just draw this and like identify the paintings or the date. Um, so, and Add that to the mix. <laughs> so how blue is Krishna? These paintings depict Krishna, you'll say blue, right? But how artists translated this color varied, and sometimes even within a single manuscript. And we should I mean, acknowledge an obvious challenge here that translating a color or discussing color for that matter, uh, color value is notoriously difficult. After all, these are digital images of the paintings that uh, we're looking at, and our experience is mitigated by the artifice, right? The, the machine that's projecting and the code that's translating the color from the camera that's took, uh, taken. And what I saw on my computer screen is different from what I'm showing you today. It, you know, it varies. And without saying, if I 
were on the phone with you and told you, oh, I'm, a, I'm wearing a blue top today. And you would think, hmm, she might be wearing a sky blue or navy blue. It will all depend on your imagination, your own circumstances. So, and I should also note that such descriptive terms like, you know, sky or navy are used through associations for a better communication. It's not based on their intrinsic values, right? So of all the brilliant primary colors present in painting in today's talk, let us focus on blue with the case of Krishna. Blue is quite an interesting color to begin with. So as one of my undergraduate students uh, a few years back who was actually a chemistry major at Harvard but also happened to love art history and uh, was fascinated by Indian art, uh, he kindly reminded me that although we see blue in the sky and water or brilliant wings of butterflies, uh, most blues that we see in nature are actually structural colors, not chemical colors. What that means is that their color is a result of light refracting in a special way rather than their molecules reflecting blue light. Yeah, let's see the difference. And the pigment, ultramarine, as we just heard, uh, made from the lapis lazuli, the precious uh, stone, is one of the very few naturally occurring blue pigments. The preciousness attached to the material due to its rarity, as you heard you know, from Dr. Kandekar uh, talk, that natural ores of lapis lazuli are extremely limited, that mostly concentrated in northern Afghanistan. And the term ultramarine really means across the sea, so it really refers to its preciousness through trade that came to Europe, basically. And it was uh, a costly commodity in ancient trade. And this uh, scarcity may explain, partly explain why so much prestige and symbolic power were attached to the color blue in many pre-modern societies. And as we will see, Krishna's blue color has a complex history, and artists' interventions played a major role in shaping what color Krishna was to be seen in any given period. So I suggest that the availability of certain materials and technical advancement in pigment preparation and application, what I would like to call artisanal intelligence developed in response to local and translocal concerns, contributed to different ways in which Krishna's color was pictorialized. So before moving on to Krishna and blue, I'd like to underscore the material and tactile quality of many of these Indian paintings. So as we see in this folio of the Rasa Manzari from Basoli now in the Harvard Art Museums, the painting's materiality is prominent. And I realize, you know, we have a, a, an example of Basoli on sort of display. You should really go see up close and sort of feel the presence of this material. So I'll show you the sort of blow up and the, this glistening beetle wheels exactly cut to the shape of the jewels on the ornaments that adorn the bodies. So you see these are poor beetles, but you know, used appropriately to really create that light reflecting texture. And raised white dots depict uh, strands of pearls. All of these elements enhance the texture of the painting surface. And you have to imagine the light of candle or burning oil lamp in which, you know, with which the probably original courtly viewers would have seen these paintings would have made this texture surface really alluring. Estuing illusionistic techniques to the minimum, the artist, who may have been Kilpal and his family members, according to Dr. Abhiyan Goswami's research, I mean, they achieved the painting's presence through tactility and materiality of the pictorial surface, heavily laden with colorants, many of which are mineral-based, inorganic pigments, and beetle wings. In fact, as I suggest in my forthcoming book titled Garland of Visions, Kala, Tantra, and a Material History of Indian Painting, from which sixth chapter this talk is drawn, um, painting's thingness, was, thingness, painting's materiality, was highly cultivated in medieval South Asia. The painterly techniques and practices developed to engender appreciation of material and tactile properties of painting throughout the first half of the second millennium. And such a strong attention to tactility and material presence of painting can be better appreciated by paying particular attention to the physical properties in each painting, like identification of pigments in use, thus my interest in pigments and scientific analysis of them. 
And in other words, turning to scientific analytical research is not a universalist superimposition on the material. Rather, I would argue that material demands such an approach to unearth an emic, which means within the tradition, so indigenous understanding and perspective. So thanks to the advancement in conservation science, we have more non-invasive means to examine and analyze the pigments in use. And miniature paintings versus murals. Murals and big paintings, you can take samples, whereas miniature paintings, you just cannot risk taking so much sample unless it's really required. So uh, it's really great to have this non-invasive means to identify certain pigments in these paintings. And uh, according to a recent material, anal material analysis done by Dr. Catherine Ehrman at the Strauss Center well, uh, at Harvard, that artists in this case use four different types of pigments, red, lead, vermilion, hematite, and probably organic red. Um, there are two different types of greens used here. The Nyka's blouse is, see when you look at this, that green and that green doesn't look that different, does it, right? But then when you actually analyze the pigment, there are different, uh, different types of pigments. So the green of the blouse is actually copper-based, whereas the green um, in architecture and fruit is a mixture of blue pigment and Indian yellow. So the use of different types of pigments for color supports the argument for the agency of artists in making artistic choices. So knowledge of color's symbolic meanings and optical values seems to have informed artists' choice and use of certain colors, often in response to the demands of patrons and knowledge experts. Purely aesthetic consideration of harmony and balance in color composition at times play an equally important role in artistic decisions, and of course the availability of certain grades of pigments was also a factor. Identifying pigments in use in, uh, in close comparison with the colors discussed in theoretical texts and treatises affords us a glimpse into artists' intimate and embodied knowledge of, the, of each color's material properties, knowledge probably learned through years of preparation of pigments in individual containers, whether in coconut shells, as contemporary Fata or Patwa painters do in Bengal, or um, in gores as described in 7th century literature in Bana's Harsha Charita. So with this understanding in mind, we now turn to the business of Krishna. So let us you know, begin by exploring Krishna as the color term. So color terms are really difficult to pin down as much ex as conveying color objectively. And Sanskrit's fluid semantic range compounds the difficulty while dealing with color, when dealing with color in historical and textual sources. So uh, Color terms actually begin to appear more systematically in Sanskrit artistic treatises. So in the Natya Shastra, the foundational text in Indian um, aesthetic theory, rasas, you know, the taste or the you know, essence of aesthetic experience, are categorized in color terms. So quote, the erotic is blue-black, the comic is white, the tragic is gray, and the violent red. The heroic is golden, the fearful, black, the macabre blue, and the fantastic yellow, end quote. This list, if you were just following and thinking about the color, is by no means systematic. And there may be sort of psychosomatic reasons for sort of assignment for specific colors to specific emotion-driven rasas in, these, in this treatise on drama. And there's another research project for somebody else. I you know, would love to explore, but I can't <laughs> at the moment. That what I quoted is Pollock, uh, you know, Sheldon Pollock's English translation of a text of Natya Shastra, and his English translation renders the color terms straightforwardly. So, for example, Shyama, for Shungara, the erotic is translated as blue-black, whereas Krishna, for Paya, the fearful, is translated as black, and while Nila, for the Makabar, is translated as blue. So you note that uh, Krishna and Nila are differentiated here, right? The primary colors identified in the Chitra Sutra section of the Vishnu Dharmotara also differ between Krishna and Nila. The five primary colors, Mula Rang, is what the, the, the text says. For painterly, 
practice according to the Sutra Sutra are white, Shveta, yellow, Pita, red, Vilohita, and blue, Nila, and black, Krishna. So in this case, it is justifiable to trans translate the term Krishna as black and uh, blue as Nila, since they are differentiated. But what optical color values that this Krishna would have meant at the time of this text composition and also throughout the first millennium remains challenging to determine. And in fact, interestingly, I will note in my survey of color terms in Sanskrit and sort of later literature, I found that color terms of darker hues like Shyama and Krishna were even more unstable than others. So as you saw in the Krishna call-up images, the, in today's popular visual culture, Vishnu is dominantly depicted in blue, along with his two most revered human incarnations, Ram and Krishna. The fixation of blue color for Vishnu and his human incarnations may in fact be related to the understanding of the term Krishna as blue, which was most likely shaped by artistic interventions. The challenge of translating a color term pictorially is exemplified in one of the earliest known illustrated manuscripts of the Hindu epic Ramayana, prepared during the reign of the Mughal Emperor Akbar. This is a page from the Freya Ramayana manuscript that dates to about 1597 to 1604. And in this manuscript, if you go through, I mean, it's available online, you can go and look at them yourself, that you will see page by page, it's not consistent. The, the, you notice where Rama is, right? That would be Rama. And um, the artist rendered Rama in various dark shades from light, bluish gray to gray, while rendering in, uh, Vishnu in brilliant blue. So there is that Vishnu, where is, see the different colors that are used by different artists? This darker kind of grayish colors might be an attempt to render Rama as recorded in the text whose body color is described as Shama. And it might be sort of the artist trying to literally translate it in, in whatever way they can do. And, and it seems there are different artists working with the same manuscript to have, may seem to have interpreted this dark color, monsoon color, uh, like monsoon cloud-like color, like you know today's I guess it kind of comes close to today's cloud color, right? Uh, like color differently. On the other hand, in this famed, oops, <laughs> Jaga Singh Ramayana manuscript, and this is actually in the CSMBS collection, um, there's no hesitation in depicting Rama as brilliant blue, which I hope at, or think most likely mineral blue, like uh, ultramarine or azurite, um, instead of organic blue like indigo. So I don't know if you can see, this is actually depicting the same moment in the epic. The Rama here is you know, slightly darker skin than maybe Lakshmana, whereas you have no mistaking Rama in this scene, right? So they have very different approach to how you're going to depict Ram in, in these paintings. In the indigenous circles of manuscript production, the blue color of Ram seems to have been already widely accepted, as seen in the illustrated paper manuscript of the Aranya Kaparvan of the Mahabharata dated uh, 1516, now in the Asiatic Society, again in Mumbai. So Mumbai is a treasure trove for finding these examples. Um, and here, Rama is consistently depicted in dark blue color, and you even, it, it even says Ram, right? You, you really do say this blue guy, that's Ram. And I suspect this may have an indigo base and dying to know what the color that was used in this manuscript was. Krishna is confidently painted blue in early illustrated paper manuscripts of the Bhagavata Purana, like the so-called dispersed Bhagavata Purana series of uh, about 1520, probably from the reason of Matra, or in bright blue in an undated illustrated manuscript of the Gita Govinda of the early 16th century, now in the NC Meta collection in Ahmedabad. Oh no, Baroda, sorry. No, Ahmedabad. <laughs> what Baroda? And an illustrated manuscript of the Balagopala Stuti, now in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, has Krishna consistently painted in blue, and his color really stands out against plain red background. 
Uh, the manuscript, this manuscript remains undated, but given the stylistic similarity to the rare painted scroll on cloth of the Vasanta Villasa now in the Freer Gallery dated 15, no, uh, 1451, it likely dates to an early to mid 15th century date. So in all three cases that I just shown you in rapid succession, the bright blue color of Krishna is unmistakable and the confidence and consistency suggests an established understanding that Krishna means brilliant, brilliant blue by this time. So here we may hypothesize that availability and the introduction of ultramarine in particular may have had an impact on the adoption of the brilliant blue hue of Krishna. Only further research on the material properties of color in these early manuscripts would confirm the types of pigments used in these examples. It seems likely that Indian painters had access to both mineral-based pigments, like ultramarine or azurite, and organic ones, like indigo, by the beginning of the 15th century, and they used them discerningly. So a material analysis performed in the 1990s confirmed the use of ultramarine for painting Krishna on the pages, on a page from the dispersed Bhagavata Purana in the VNA. And Gettens, whose uh, research and the handbook was just mentioned in the talk by Dr. Kandekar, uh, he actually sort of did a scientific analysis of this uh, for your uh, Basanta Vilasa and published it, his finding. And he actually confirmed that it actually, the artists used both indigo and ultramarine discerningly that so this border is indigo whereas these brilliant blue is ultramarine. And lapis lazuli is also, uh, I'm sorry, the ultramarine and indigo are also confirmed on an illustrated chain paper manuscript of the Uttaradhyan Sutra now in the VNA which dates to the mid 15th century. So it is unclear when this formula of Vishnu equals Krishna equals blue may have been introduced. And unfortunately, I don't have a, a straight answer to you for that question. We'll have to keep digging. Few paintings depict Vaishnava iconography that may date to pre-1400 actually survive in northern India, actually. Here, trans-regional and trans-sectarian approaches to Indian painting can be helpful as painted Hindu manuscripts that date as early as the late 11th century survive from Nepal, and painted images of Hindu deities are included in some early Buddhist manuscripts. So this uh, the painted wooden, wooden cover for a Vishnu Dharma manuscript may be one of the earliest surviving examples of painted images of Vishnu, that too in a spectrum of color with blue one in the center. The idea of Vishnu as a blue deity was certainly known to 12th century manuscript makers in Buddhist monastic circles in Eastern India. So when Vishnu and Shiva are included in the retinue welcoming the Buddha back to the earth from his visit with his late mother in Trishamsha heaven, the crowd includes Shiva and the, ooh, it died on me. You know who I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Well, of course, that Vishnu was painted blue does not necessarily prove or disprove that the term Krishna as a color term was understood as blue in the 12th century. Because in an earlier sort of Nepalese Buddhist manuscript cover now in Lakma, for example, this forearm Vishnu is sort of painted in a dark shade of greenish hue, although this might be a sort of change in color over time. So we'll have to actually do a testing to confirm what color that was or what pigment that was or a manuscript of the Harivamsha prepared in uh, Nepal Asambhat 292, which would equal 1172. So these are very early examples of Hindu painted manuscripts that survive from Nepal. And it survived with painted covers and, and they really provide some interesting color information in Vishnu's pictorial iconography. The book covers feature rare narrative renditions of the 10 incarnations of Vishnu. You really don't see this kind of renditions of Vishnu's 10 incarnations in this period in time. So it's very exceptional. And they include what may be the only surviving miniature painting of the Churning of the Ocean episode. I don't know if you can sort of uh, see. It's cut off here. See that turtle? Right? The, the Churning of the Ocean episode that's uh, depicted here. And each panel is divided into five sections. It's each section contains one of the 10 avatars, and starting with Machya, Kuruma, Varaha, Narasinga, 
Pamela Trivikrama on one, and the other one is Parashrama, Ram, Krishna, Buddha, and Kalki on. Um, so the iconography is clear, and an easily recognizable moment is chosen from each epic. So the panel depicting Rama actually has dress him, you know, in an armor. I will go with this guy being Ram and this guy being Ram, Ravana, and you notice that he's actually, you know, not blue, right? Not yet, at least in the 12th century. And Rava, Rama and Ravana's skin color is differentiated, it seems, there. Whereas the, the least clear iconography in this set of panel painting is this one, and I mean, the logical conclusion is this is going to be Krishna. I've never really encountered any depiction of this nature, so I'm assuming this might actually be the, you know, really mischievous Krishna. And however you read this, if you really think that little boy is Krishna, you, that dark blue-black skin color of a childlike figure striking a blue male figure in the center, maybe what the unnamed artist in 12th century Nepal envisioned as the color of Krishna. So more scientific material analysis on the Indic manuscript painting that date to the period before 1500 would help us discern a pattern of change when the defin definitive shift to brilliant blue Krishna may have happened. So for example, whether the blue used in this Aranyaka Parvan was indigo or ultramarine or some other blue pigment would be extremely interesting to understand as that manuscript's design, this, this manuscript's this entire design logic seems very innovative and experimental. And it is to be seen whether the color use also bears this, uh, out this aspect. So while this remains one of many future tests that's in, for the study of history of Indian painting, a recent analysis conducted at MFA for my forthcoming book suggests that ultramarine was scarcely used in, in Indic painterly circles prior to 1500. Indigo or organic blue dye seems to have been the most common material of choice to create blue color in early manuscript paintings, which suggests we may need to revise this commonly held assumption that ultramarine was used extensively in these early you know, Indian Buddhist paintings or South Asian paintings. So as I mentioned earlier, a recent material analysis performed at Harvard uh, confirms this droll-like appearance of the Basoli paintings that really enthrall the early 12th, 20th century artists like Amrita Shargil. She called this, you know, this lovely Basoli thing. She was so fascinated by these paintings and she really turned to this very bright red color in her own painting. And these sort of droll-like appearance of the Basoli paintings are actually thanks to their physical properties. As mentioned before, the page is literally laden with material substances, including gold and silver in the architecture and the details of jewelry. And the silver has tarnished over the centuries. I couldn't believe that they actually used silver on these. See these like, little lines are actually silver and you just can't see, but if you see it in person, it still has that metallic shimmer. And you understand that what a luxurious sort of uh, production this was. So the choice of colors and different you know, types of color pigment that are used here, it seems the artist seems to have been enthusiastic about reaping the benefits from the diversity of available pigments and to have experimented with different hues that can be achieved with available pigment resources. He, as I mentioned, he used two different uh, types of green. The bright green on the blouse is a copper chloride. The green on the roof is a mixture of indigo and Indian yellow. The bright yellow backdrop that fills the earth up to the ho high horizon in the painting is, yeah. well, you see the yellow. <laughs> and that's the yellow that you saw earlier, like the cow dung yellow, right? Um, <laughs> um, the bright yellow backdrop is Indian yellow, so it's a yellow skirt and the scarf of the naika. The orange dhoti of Krishna slash Nayaka is in fact a combination of Indian yellow and red lead. The extensive use of Indian yellow as a luminous quality to the painting along with gold, silver, and iridescent beetle wings. Indian yellow actually fluoresces under UV light and the painting would have, been, have nearly fluoresced even under sunlight. These artistic choices make the painting appear exquisite. 
Here we also find the 17th century use of smalt, a cobalt-based pigment that is chosen to convey the double identity of the male figure as Krishna. How many blue Krishna were prepared using this new blue pigment remains to be seen, or whether the introduction of smalt had something to do with the introduction of the pigment through trade, or whether it was owes its existence to an indigenous tradition, that also remains to be seen. As I end this talk, I'd like to share a new discovery uh, made in the course of material analysis of pre-1500 uh, common era Indic manuscript painting at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston conducted for my forthcoming book. So this is a page from a paper manuscript of the Galpa Sutra. If you're a connoisseur, you will just know this is a Jain manuscript you know, page on paper, probably like 15th century. It is dated, 1497 is a date, and it's in the MFA collection. The liberal use of gold accentuated by blue, red, black, white, and occasional green, it just fits the period and the, the, the use of color. But the material analysis reveals some unusual elements. It's most notably, this brilliant blue on its surface turns out to contain cobalt, possibly suggesting the use of smalt, ground form of blue animal class. If this is indeed smalt from the 15th century, this may be one of the earliest examples where smalt is in use in Indic manuscript painting. The analysis suggests copper-based green, possibly malachite, instead of a mixture of indigo and orpiment, which is more common uh, the way of doing green. If green here is indeed malachite, this also may suggest diversification of pigments available at manuscript artist's disposal. We may hypothesize that new pigments were introduced and experimented with as paper was adopted as a new support medium for painting and manuscript production. Only further research will reveal how diverse and experimental pigments used in 15th century Indic manuscript paintings may have been. And paper as a medium seems to have enabled different methods of pigment application from the method used on palm leaf. So in, the, um, in this page, actually, all colors are applied as additional layers on top of an expensive swath of gold. So the whole thing is gold, and they added pigment over it. So brilliant, deep blue, shimmering white, shining red, iridescent green, and matte vermilion appear to have been inlaid into a golden surface, like animal. So the use of smalt identified on a late 15th century giant manuscript in the MFA study raises a question of whether it may be a later alteration, because smalt's use as pigments is understood to happen later in time. We just heard about you know, the issues of provenance and you know, pigments can help sort of pinpoint that. Earlier scholarship on smalt use, like I'm talking like at least 20th century scholarship on smalt use, as pigment believed, I mean on pigment, smalt that it was invented in Europe sometime in the 16th century. Despite various instances of smalt use in other parts of the world, this European th origin theory still holds, holds strong and smalt use in 15th century Indian miniature painting raises an authenticity question. On the other hand, much of the knowledge we have at hand uh, regarding pigments and their characteristics and history of use is not based on an extensive study of pigments in Indian painting and our current knowledge base is uh, somewhat lacking. The smalt's use as pigment in 15th century India is definitely not an impossible scenario, and one may start actually looking for clues to understand this usage in all your uh, period. Similarly, the appearance of zinc white in 16th century miniature painting prepared in India, like the Cleveland Tutiname manuscript, may be deemed problematic as later alterations. As a documented production and use of zinc white as a pigment is believed to begin only at the end of the 18th century. But zinc smelting and zinc's general usage were well known in India from ancient times. So an intact ancient zinc distillation furnace has been found that is believed to have been in operation in the 14th century or earlier. It was found in a zinc mine in Zawar in Rajasthan. And this zinc mine's operation actually goes back to a few centuries before the beginning of the common era. Just as an observant artist, chance encounter with the dried up urine of a cow or cattle showing brilliant yellow particles may have inspired the eventual production of Indian yellow. And this is a completely conjectural hypothesis, by the way. I don't repeat this. But the adoption of zinc white by some resourceful Indian artists much before its production in European factories 
may be a distinct possibility, especially given zinc's abundant production and medical use in ancient and medieval India. Further material and scientific investigations into the world of Indian painting of the second millennium may reveal hitherto unknown early instances of certain pigments. So when I started working on this project, I naively thought the scientific analysis of pigments would answer all my questions about painterly techniques and pigments. And what I've learned from working with conservation scientists is that scientific analysis does not meet a straightforward answer to the question of pigment identification whether it is an interpretive endeavor dealing with a realm of possibilities. As conservation science opens more doors for artistical studies, I think it is also important to acknowledge the inherent bias in existing knowledge on pigments and to be open-minded about the resourcefulness of these artists of pre-modern South Asia that contributed to expanding an ordinary person's ability to, to see things more colorful. Thank you. We now open the session to a brief question and answer. We'll take about three to four questions. So can we have the lights, please? The word, uh, word Krishna, besides meaning black, also comes from akarshan, which means to attract or allure. So there is a non-color. So Krishna is not only black, but Krishna is one that attracts and allures from the Sanskrit root akarshan. And that is another meaning of the word Krishna. Right, right. Yeah. So thank you for that suggestion. So I had a question for Narayan. Uh, the pigments that you were talking about, the early pigments, what was the mixing medium for it? Like, was it mostly oil or water or anything more innovative? Um, so, sorry, can you, which, which pigments in particular? You? The early pigments that you were talking about? Oh, uh, so they, they get mixed with all different kinds of media and we have a collection of some 500 different media samples as well. So they, they can be used in distemper, which is animal skin glue, rabbit skin glue, egg, um, oil, gum arabic, it can be any of those. So the, you, ne you, need a, you need the colour but you also need something to hold it in place and something that allows you to brush it, give it impasto to, you know, it, drying properties, matteness, glossness and so on. So pigments get used with lots and lots of different binding media. Thank you. wonderful talk. Uh, I had a question for Professor Kim. Um, it just came to my mind that the word saula or saula both in Hindi and Marathi are kind of associated with Krishna which means dark skin. So would you say the use of color blue is associated more with this idea of Krishna being dark skin or the other way around? I don't know what came first but would you associate that uh, to the color, the usage of color blue? Well, I mean, I think th the idea of sort of dark skinned is there first, it seems, than just that the choice of color blue, that, you know, as you s surviving evidence, at actually, you know, that it's not, and we don't really have any other paint surviving before, let's say, like, thousand to really confirm what people in, like, seventh century Elora saw Krishna blue. So, it's, you know, it's an open-ended question, but I think there is that element of dark skinness is the idea first and how artists translated it another, right? And I, as I said, it's that preciousness that's attached to the ultramarine that might have done it actually, and it's brilliant color too, so uh, that's a hypothesis, but as I said, I don't have any really straightforward answer to this, like, pattern of change. I just notice a change, but when that happens and how that actually transpires, I really does need a lot more sort of data on. I have seen uh, miniature artists using uh, 
lot of indigo based uh, colors in olden time. The question is for both of you, which one is older and which one came later? So you have lapis lazuli based, uh, mineral based pigment yeah. and the plant based pigment which is indigo. Yeah. Which one is earlier? I, so I think in terms of use in paintings, they're both ancient pigments. They've both been available for a long time. What we need to do is look at them like Jean has been doing in an artistic chronology and determine what was used and why it was used. So we can actually track changes over time with different artists, different ways of representing something. So, and that all means something. Every pigment has meaning piled onto it. So it's, what you're asking is a simple question with a complicated answer. Yeah, I mean, it's for Kim, I mean, you said there is more indigo or, or other organic blues. Is, it, uh, the, is there any, any other organic blue other than indigo? Well, organic blue, organic uh, pigment is very hard to actually identify it specifically, right? I mean, Dr. Kandekar can answer that better than I can, but like whether that organic blue is indigo, and indigo, by the way, has different plants. If you actually look down the botanical names of indigo, it's different actually areas actually have different plant matter to u create that color. So, you know, South Asia has a different type of plant than what's used in China. It's a slightly different species of the same gen genus of the, the whole cl surrogate class of plant, right? So it's hard to pinpoint, but it seems when you have organic material, so when you do that kind of XRF analysis, only the ones that you can actually pick up with mineral and you know, that respond to this can be read. Organic material, if you want to pinpoint, you really do need more information and sometimes you really do need to sample it and actually analyze it in different methods. So it's hard to pinpoint whether that's indigo is based on what plant, right? I'm sorry, but my question was, is there any other organic blue other than indigo? I don't. Because I, I thought no. you mentioned something like that. That's why yeah. the no, 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 no. Not, not, not until the uh, yeah, post Second World War. Yeah, I don't think so. there is anything other than genus yeah. of plant that used like widely all mm. over actually. It's just very, I mean, some different types of plants are used, but definitely it's the same genus understand and, and its stability as a blue depends on its preparation as well so there are some prepar like you see this in Dutch paintings a lot they've done a lot of study on the, the blues um, that some ways of preparing it produce a very color fast blue and then other ways it fades very quickly and you, you actually find that with jeans as well denim jeans that you know cheap jeans fade very quickly and, and expensive jeans last a lot longer Which is that fantastic aquamarine, and that it was a common practice at that period. I, I learned that no from the China exhibition, which was on many uh, four or five years ago at the VNA. I don't know actually. The, like we don't know what the so we don't know the recipe for ultramarine that was sort of you know I don't know if you have information on how the sort of aquamarine ultramarine like last I mean it's all based on sim similar chemical composition. It's just method of preparation. We, I mean, in Persian literature, in like late 16th century, you actually find recipes for different pigments production, whereas in India, we really don't get that. Uh, so we will have to rely a lot on yeah. analysis. Well, again, you know, it's, it's a, a combination of analysis of the actual object itself, and then also connecting it to 
sort of historical material as well. So we, scientists need to work with conservators and art historians, and that way we get a, a more rounded understanding of a work of art. It's one thing to identify sand and ultramarine. It's another thing to un understand what that means. And so we identify it, we talk to Gina, who can then say this means something. And then that actually helps us understand the object in the best possible way. Friends and colleagues, on behalf of the trustees and the staff of CSMVS, I take this opportunity to thank everyone involved in this evening's program. Um, I must begin by thanking the speakers, Narayan Khandekar, head of the Strauss Center, Harvard University, for his wonderful illustration on how a carefully collected set of pigments are now at the center of important and cross-disciplinary research. And of course, to Gina Kim, director, arts program, the Mittal Institute, for sharing her nuanced narrative on the color and pigments in the paintings of Krishna. Thank you. We thank the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute, Harvard University, for their wonderful collaboration for today's talk and the exploratory programs that will follow in the next few months. Today's program has been generously supported by Jay and Sugandha Hiramet, Haikal Limited, and we remain grateful for your contributions to the arts. Sir. Ladies and gentlemen, your curiosities and presence greatly encourage our initiatives, and we thank you all for being today particularly our friends who stood through the lecture at the back. Thank you for being so patient. <laughs> we, are happy, we are happy to share that the fifth Vimal Shah Memorial Lecture will be delivered by the dynamic environmentalist and thinker Bittu Sehgal on the theme of living and non-living heritage on Thursday, 16th August, 6 p.m. at this very venue. And hopefully there will be no buns, so please come. Uh, please do like and follow our social media pages and spread the word so that many more guests can come and enjoy our lectures. Good night and have fun. <laughs>